Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Boswell Virtual Event Series. I'm Daniel Golden, the proprietor of Boswell. It is day 4,170 of us being in business through tonight's event. We are so honored to welcome back Margot Lipsy uh, for her second time at Boswell, and I believe she's been to Milwaukee before for Schwartz and for UWM. Um, this event has been on our book so long that it was actually originally not going to be virtual. So uh, we've been uh, looking forward to the boy in the field for a long time, and boy has boy has it been uh, worth the wait. The book's gotten wonderful reviews, um, starred advanced reviews all over the place, and the New York Times Book Review called the book exquisite. Uh, Lucy is also the author of Flight of Gemma Hardy, uh, Mercury, um, House on, on Fortune Street, and many other books. Uh, tonight, she's in conversation with fellow writer, UWM professor of English, and uh, Margot Longtime friend, Aliyah Callanan, uh, the author of Paris by the Book, uh, as well as other novels and an essay collection called Listen. Uh, he puts my dress to shame. I'm a little embarrassed, but um, I'm willing to be uh, second fiddle in, or, 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 or I don't even think I would get um, second prize. Yeah, okay. So um, that said, let's give a big hand for them both. Thank you very much, uh, Margot Lucy. Thanks for coming to Milwaukee. And, and thank you. Thank you. So Daniel said I should open up with like an hour long discussion of just kind of my whims and thoughts on just sartorial dress. Uh, I'm very excited to be sharing a screen here with all of you and with Margot tonight. And I was going to just invite her. I think the way this evening's going to work is that she's going to read for a little bit, talk about the book, read for a little bit. Uh, then she and I are going to have a conversation, totally surprise questions all the way through. Uh, then we're going to take some questions from the audience and she might read a little bit just to kind of send us out. It's a beautiful book. I wish you could read the whole thing. In fact, I have a story about that, which is I got a very early draft of this book in electronic form and I was able to rig it up so that my computer could read it aloud to me on a uh, quarantine trip that we took within the state of Wisconsin. We had to keep driving because we couldn't stop listening and reading to Margo's book. We wound up in Bayfield, Wisconsin, which is the farthest northernmost town in the state. And that's how good this book is. But you don't have to drive anywhere if you want to get it. Just order from Boswell Books and you'll be able to be enchanted all night. But Margo, rather than me kind of fumbling my way through this discussion, if you could read and maybe talk a little bit about the book and then I can fix my bow tie. <laughs> Liam. Thank you so much. Um, it's and your bow tie looks already immaculate. I oh, would good, good. and I have to say thank you for providing the ideal landscape for my novel. Yes, a field in Oxfordshire, very like the field where my novel begins. That was just brilliantly thoughtful. And if only my characters could appear in say the lower left corner, it would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and thank you um, for inviting me back to Boswell's. I have been excited about coming back to Milwaukee for months and months and months. So this is really the high, one of the high points of my year. And I'm very grateful to Daniel for his hospitality once again. And, and I'm very grateful to all of you um, for coming to, to listen to Liam and me tonight. I'm just going to read the opening because the opening um, sets up really everything that happens in the novel in a, in a certain way um, and sets up the uh, characters and the landscapes that inhabit the novel. And I don't need to comment to, I feel I can cut some of my description of the landscape because of Liam's brilliant photograph. Um, Part one, the field. Here is what happened one wet, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> the field. Here is what happened one Monday in the month of September in the last year of the last century. Matthew, Zoe and Duncan Lang were on their way home from school. Usually they took the bus from the larger town where they attended secondary school to the smaller town where they lived. But that morning, their father had said he had an errand to run and would collect them. So they waited beside the school gates and watched the bus depart. 
After 15 minutes with no sign of the familiar car, they began to walk along the road that led to their town. They each wore a black pullover, sorry, they each wore a version of the school uniform, a white shirt, black trousers and a black pullover. Expecting their father to appear at any moment, they walked fast, making it a game to see how far they could get before he pulled up beside them. They left the last houses behind. Hawthorn hedges and an occasional ash tree hid the fields that bordered the road. Through one gate they saw a herd of cows, through another rows of barley. The afternoon was warm and still, only a few leaves fringed with brown hinted at autumn. Zoe was the one who spotted something through the hedge. She had a gift for finding things birds' nests, their mother's calculator, a missing book, a secret. What's that? she demanded, stooping to peer through the tangled branches. The flash of red could have been poppies bordering the field, but the poppies had already lost their petals. Before her brothers could answer, she turned and ran back to the gate they had just passed. Matthew and Duncan watched her go. Zoe brought her knees high and pumped her arms. Last sports day, she had won the quarter mile by almost three seconds. As she reached the gate, Duncan, without a word, took off after her. A car sped by. Matthew looked at the sky, mostly blue with a fortress of cumulus clouds in the east, and gave up on being the responsible one who waited for their father. The two bags, his and Zoe's, banged against the metal bars of the gate as he climbed over and jumped down onto the rutted ground. The field had recently been harvested and circular bales of straw lay randomly across the dull gold, the dull gold stubble. In the middle of the field stood a magnificent oak tree in full leaf. Matthew caught up with first Duncan, then Zoe. From a distance, it was still possible to believe that the boy was asleep, lying on the grassy border between hedge and stubble. Christ, whispered Zoe. The closer they got to him, the slower they walked. None of them spoke. Glinting bluebottles and smaller flies circled the boy. His hair was dark, his skin very pale. He wore a deep blue shirt, a colour Duncan would later call cobalt, black shorts and what appeared to be long red socks. At the local private school, the younger boys wore bright red knee socks and for the briefest instant, Zoe thought, oh, he's in uniform. A few steps closer and she grasped the nature of the red. His eyelids were pale with a delicate tracery of veins. Everything that happened, they all three later agreed, was only possible because of those closed eyelids. The boy's chest rose fractionally and fell fractionally. With no one to tell them what to feel, they did not cry out or exclaim. Zoe tiptoed forward, knelt down at a cautious distance and leaned over to touch his bare arm where it emerged below his shirt sleeve. The boy's skin was reassuringly warm. He was a little older than her, 18, perhaps 19. We need to get help, she said. Oh, I can't hear you, Liam. Oh, that's just a, I was mute with admiration. That was wonderful. And I was wondering if you could just give us an introduction to the book itself and how it unspools from there. And maybe as part of that, talk a little bit about as a, a writer and as a reader, I'm always interested in that first grain of sand that irritated the oyster into making a pearl. So like, what, where did this book start? I think like many books, it had several sources. Um, one very specific one was meeting after an absence of more than 30 years, someone who had been to the boys' half of the school I attended. It was a segregated school. And 
this man told me uh, how he had come home one summer afternoon to the very small village where he lived, a village where no one locked their doors, where there was no crime. And he had found at the bottom of the garden the body of a young woman who had just been killed by her boyfriend. And it was an utterly shocking thing to happen. Uh, he maybe spent 15 seconds in her company and it completely changed his life. He went in a very, very different direction than what he'd been imagining. And I was very fascinated by his description and also very aware that his description was the, um, like the opening cliche, if you will, of many, many detective stories, the body of a young woman. So I thought that's really, really interesting. But if I do it, I have to do something different. I, I don't want to add to the body count for women. So I stored that idea away. And then I read a wonderful interview with a, a detective writer. I mean, a writer of detective novels in The New Yorker, uh, Louise Walsh. And she talked about how the detective is the, the person of virtue walking into the valley of shadow and about how the, a big part of the pleasure of the detective novel is the, is the contract between author and reader that the world will be set to right, that there is an act of violence, but a solution will be found. And that really caught my attention and made me think about, about that. And I also, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I have one more thought, but I'll keep that in reserve. <laughs> well, this is a way to talk about or to introduce us into each of the characters in this book, and especially the three siblings who've just discovered this body in the field. And one of the things that I feel, uh, maybe the phrase gets overused, this is a book club book, but this really is because you really get at some elemental things that I can see clubs kind of arguing about the nature of truth and the nature of mystery and what does it mean to, to do art. And, and I thought it'd be a really interesting lens to talk about this book, at least for a little while before we invite others into the conversation to give everybody a real introduction into each of these characters. So it's, we've got Matthew, the oldest, then Zoe, his younger sister. And then there's a bigger gap of years. Duncan is about 13, I believe. Yes. And so he's the youngest of all. But I, with Matthew is the one who uh, kind of becomes the, almost the proto-detective in the book. And was that a character that just came to you that way? Did you want to have a stand? Because you also have an actual detective in the book. I, I do. I think that, um, I, you know, I, like many British children, I read, grew up reading these books about children who were detectives. I think there may be American equivalents of this, but I was always convinced I would be the one who solved the, the, the crime. Um, in, you know, Enid Blyton or um, whatever. Um, so it seemed natural to me that uh, Matthew would seek to figure out the boy's assailant. And I should say that the boy, although he's wounded, he recovers. His wounds are not fatal. And um, I felt like that fit with his somewhat analytical personality and his desire to make sense of the world, to put the world to rights. And as I wrote the novel, I gradually felt a, a need for a, a proper detective. I mean, I thought I also need to have a kind of figure standing over Matthew who can bring a, a somewhat more professional <laughs> attitude to trying to solve the crime. And for Zoe, I was, I really wanted um, someone who would ponder the nature of truth and lies and perception and be intrigued by these moral ethical questions as many of the young people I know are. And I will say that was another inspiration for the novel was people like, well, there's no one like her, but I was going to say Greta Thunberg or the teenagers who stepped forward after the Parkland shootings, young people with a very strong sense of right and wrong who are not convinced by our adult love of compromise. And so Zoe is very intrigued by the truth and she's also the, the one who's 
seeking in a way to escape the family. She doesn't want to be a sister. She doesn't want to be a daughter. She wants someone to see her, Zoe, as an individual, which is another way of saying she's looking for someone to fall in love with. And she starts searching the streets of Oxford. Um, and Duncan, the youngest, is an artist. Um, he, he thinks of himself that way at 13. And he is adopted, but prior to finding the boy in the field, he's never really thought about the fact he's adopted. It was just, you know, I have, I have brown hair, I'm adopted, I'm five foot four. It was just another fact about him. And after finding the boy, he suddenly feels a real need, if possible, to find his birth mother. He doesn't want to live with her. He doesn't want to leave his beloved family, his real family, he thinks. But he would like to know where he comes from. And he sets out to find her if he possibly can. I mean, one of the, <clears throat> I'm getting choked up just answering this. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the wonderful things about this book is it's, it's full of mysteries, actually. It's the core mystery of what happened to the boy in the field and how did he find there and who did that to him. And that pulls us through the book. But then there's also each of the characters has their own mystery to unravel. And I've noticed that this is uh, something that you've been interested in in Mercury and for that even before the architecture of the book. Am I breaking up a little bit audio wise? Just momentarily. But okay. Back. Maybe the angels were trying to speak to us both. But if you could talk a little bit about is there a special challenge? Did you work from the end, as some mystery writers work from the end to the beginning? or? I did not. I, I stumbled forward. Um, years ago, before he wrote Devil in a Blue Dress, I met the writer Walter Mosley. And we were talking about favorite writers. His favorite writer, I remember him saying, was Camus and The Stranger. And he said this thing that really stayed with me, which, was, which is that every novel should have a mystery, a true mystery. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's really good writerly advice. That's really helpful. And so I was hoping to have exactly what you say, to have a detective story, if you will, underlying the novel or maybe being the spine of the novel and then to have Matthew, Zoe and Duncan each each searching for something, each on a what one might call a quest. Um, okay. And there's something mysterious about their quests. There is and how they kind of interlock and join and we move from one person's head to another and to another and to another. There was something I wanted to ask about in terms not just of making mystery but making books i was very interested we heard about in the beginning of the talk that this was the first the last year of the last century so i as a writer i envy you you did not have to worry about smartphones you didn't have to worry about twitter was it was that a very conscious choice on your point it was a very conscious choice i think partly because of the origin story from the young, from the man who told me about finding the body but it was also that I wanted my three protagonists, my three teenagers, to have quite a lot of autonomy. And my perception is that with mobile phones, teenagers have less autonomy than they used to, that parents are often checking up on them. And I, I also I feel that even 20 years ago was a more benign time than, well, it has to be a more benign time than what we are in now experiencing. But there was also a kind of slightly ominous feeling about the last months of 1999. We, we thought that maybe something terrible would happen with Y2K, that planes would fall from the sky, that computers would implode. And we were right. Danger was coming, but danger was coming from a direction in which we were not looking. Right, exactly. The, and the, I was just thinking about, I mean, one of the things I marveled at was when Duncan starts to look for his mother, this doesn't get too much away, that uh, he resorts to the phone book. And I thought, phone books? I haven't encountered a phone book in a while. Uh, can we talk a little bit about 
Duncan as an artist because I thought some of the things that he has to say about art reminded me a lot about the writing life as well. And there's in fact kind of a quotation uh, that I want to read here. He has a, and then while you're answering, I'm going to put in some earbuds to fix the sound. He says he's looking at a series of paintings by Giorgio Morandi featuring some deceptively simple bottles. And he says that his teacher says the paintings are in conversation with each other and the viewer. Do you feel like that's something that happens with uh, the writing of books or books in conversation with each other and the reader? I think so. Um, and yes, I years ago in New York, I went to see an exhibition of the work of a painter called William Bailey. Um, and he worked, his paintings were in the realistic tradition, but he worked by building them up over months and months, just adding shadows and intonations, if you will, to, to the paintings. And uh, a little later, I went to see a, a fantastic exhibition of Mirandi's work at the Metropolitan. And I think like perhaps almost everyone who saw that exhibition was spellbound by this seemingly simple work. These Mirandi paints five or six bottles or vases over and over again. And the paintings were at once quite simple and quite complicated, which interested me. Um, Morandi, Morandi lived with his sisters in Bologna. He painted in his bedroom and he had um, uh, something that looked like, like a cross between a ladder and a bookcase on which he auditioned the bottles and as they became more and more paintable they kind of rose up the shelves so they were the opposite of casually chosen and uh, I th the exhibition made me fall in love with him but so did the words of the Italian novelist Umberto Eco who described in 1948 as an Italian schoolboy who had never seen a painting by a living painter going to an exhibition in his town, an exhibition of contemporary art, and they had one painting by Mirandi, and he went every day for two weeks after school to look at that painting, and I just love what he said about it, um, his feeling for the work, how it opened all these doors for him. So Duncan is in love with Mirandi, and that makes complete sense to me. <laughs> It is, I think, a lot like how many novelists work, or I work, which is sketching something in and then filling it in and filling it in and adding things and taking them away. And I mean, revision is so central to my writing. I'm just looking down at a passage with, with that goes a little bit to what you just said there. Uh, so now I'm on these earpods, so hopefully the audio will be okay. Uh, and he's, Duncan is looking at his own, he's kind of reflecting on his own failed efforts at art making. And he's thinking about how Mirandi had looked at the bottles, truly looked at them, giving his vision over to their slender forms rather than imposing himself on them. He had painted the bottles over and over until all that remained was their essence. I need to be patient, Duncan thought. Draw a paw, he's trying to draw a dog right now. Draw a paw, an ear, an eyebrow then I might end up in a totally different place. In addition to being absolutely gorgeous prose, which I apologize if uh, Zub is uh, distorted my voice so you can't hear that, but maybe the words will come through. I'm just fascinated by the essence of the meaning there, which this notion that he just has to keep going through each piece of it and it might end up in a different place. Can you just talk a little bit about how that reflects on your own art making? If it does at all, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. Certainly with this novel, there was a lot of patience required. I had decided I really wanted to write a short novel in which quite a lot happened. So that was quite a large constraint and it meant over and over selecting a detail that would really reach the reader, just the one detail rather than the mm -hmm. full details where I, where I possibly could. And many of the scenes I did think of like pictures that I was composing them and adding in the shadows and the highlights and 
revisiting them over and over. And in writing the novel, I didn't think, I never thought about alternating between the, between the three protagonists in any rote fashion. I always thought, what does the larger story need? Mm -hmm. What play next? Um, and that determined what, what happened next. But you, you know, there is one sentence about a ficus tree that I hope no reader ever, ever pauses on, but I rewrote that sentence, I would say, upwards of 50 times. <laughs> so whenever I see it, I, I come up and I think, I wonder if I should have tried again, you know? Um, well, every word in the book looks very carefully worked over. This is, um, there's a, an old teacher trick of mine from the classroom, which is to alert the students that I'm going to ask them to weigh in in a little bit, but not ask you right now. So this is just my way to say all these wonderful guests that we have uh, joining us right now. I'm going to be asking you to join us and uh, come up with your own questions in just a little bit here. But first, I selfishly have a few more questions for my own for Mar of my own for Margo. One of them was about um, the nature of trauma, which I know is something that you did research into uh, to help figure the book, but and how trauma affects different people in different ways, including just like you were talking about the friend that you had um, who only spent 15 seconds in that slain woman's presence, but it changed his life. How did kind of trauma enter into the book for you? Was that something uh, kind of a keystone for you? And did you find yourself realizing that these characters all found it in different ways? Because they wind up doing completely different things that aren't necessarily related to the boy in the field. Yes, and that felt, um... That felt like something that for me was very central to the novel, that they might not have the conventional response, but that in some way, you know, e each of their lives had jumped the tracks, if you will, that mm -hmm. each suddenly turned in an unexpected direction, a direction that they couldn't have predicted even a few weeks before or even perhaps the day before. They were sort of jostled out of themselves. And someone told me years ago that at the uh, doorway, in the doorway of Tibetan temples, they have these very, very fierce looking gargoyles or demons to scare you out of yourself so that you will enter the temple in a receptive state, um, oh. whatever comes to you. And I think in a way of the finding the boy in the field as being a little like that, for Matthew, Zoe, and Duncan, they're sort of almost startled out of themselves. They almost forget themselves, and when they come back to themselves, they're a little bit they're a little bit different. They are, and they're 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 different, and they're older. But I like that they're not completely grown up. This is this is a coming of age tale where they're still coming of age in my mind. In any case, at the end too, which I which I loved. I mean, you kept the children as as children to a certain, even though. Zoe and Matthew certainly are older. You kind of kept them in that in that family bubble for a while and things like that. The there's a wonderful character we haven't talked about yet, and I'm really tempted to talk about. But just one more question before we do that, and I couldn't tease this anymore. But since I did go all the way to Oxfordshire to get this background behind me, could you talk a little bit about the role that setting played in crafting your book? This is not a book I would say that it could have taken place in London. Uh, or new, I mean, it could have, but I think it would have been a very different book. It would have been a very different book. And originally, I would have liked to have set it in Scotland. I had written Mercury, which was set in the States, and I was craving a return to my homeland. But in Scotland, for the most part, the landscape is um, harsher, and towns and villages are further apart. So just in terms of plausibility, I felt that the softer English landscape was more suited as a setting um, to the events of the novel. I wanted there to be a big city, Oxford, that they could go to, it to be a big city that draws strangers to it in the form of students. And, mm -hmm. and of course, a good local bus service, which, um, <laughs> <laughs> can always be said of, of Scottish towns and villages. <laughs> nor, nor American towns and villages. The, um, there's one 
So maybe what we could do, Duncan has a very special friend and I just wanted to, we don't often, when we quote about books, we don't often quote from the acknowledgement section of the novel. But in this case, I will, because there's a touching note in your acknowledgements uh, to the pupil at the Dalton School who years ago asked why the animals in my stories don't talk. Very belatedly, this is an attempt at an answer. And so I don't think it'll spoil anything to reveal to readers that the best and brightest dog to appear in print in the last decade. And Winner, I would hope, of the Pulitzer Prize for best animal representation would be Lily. Could you just give us a little bit, a, a glimpse into Lily? It real, I, I don't mean to, to, to make light. It's really a very special character. And this is from someone whose house is overrun with cats. This is the best dog ever. And could you talk a little bit about how this dog came to be uh, and how you're able to pull that uh, answer off for the, the people at the Dalton School? I visited the Dalton School um, in, in New York and I was meeting with uh, pupils at a number of levels um, from 16 downwards and the youngest pupils I met with were 10 year olds and they were a little terrifying to me. They were all wearing leather jackets and they had combination lock briefcases and they were all miniature adults. But we started talking about my stories, which they had read. They had read a couple of my stories. And um, finally, one girl raised her hand and said, um, I just have one question about your stories. Um, why, why don't the animals in your stories talk? And I thought it was such a brilliant question. And I turned back to the pupils and said, well, what about the animals in your stories? And to a girl and boy, they said, of course our animals talk. What would be the point of an animal in a story who didn't talk? And I, I just, there's something profound about the question because in children's books, animals chat away and then suddenly they seem to stop chatting. And I thought, but maybe they don't have to. <laughs> so mm -hmm. is my attempt <laughs> to have an animal who's as close as possible to satisfying Megan's request for my future work. It's very well done. It's very well, and it's not, and for those who have not read the book yet, it, it's not what you think it's handled. It's handled in a completely magical way. It's, a, it's just wonderful. Would you like to maybe read another little chunk? And then on the other side of that, I'll invite some other voices into the conversation. If we don't get questions, then I'll fire off yet more of mine. Great. Um, I'm just going to read a short passage. Duncan uh, is really, really missing the family dog, Arthur Adaxant, who has died a few months ago. And he persuades his father to go with him to the animal rescue to adopt a dog. But when he meets the dogs at the animal rescue, there are so many of them that want to come home with him that he can't choose. And this is what happens a, a few days later. Duncan was leaving the newsagents, his new pencils paid for and in a bag, when he saw the card in the window, a drawing of a dog, black, with large eyes and large paws, nicely done by someone not particularly skilled. Good dog, free to good home. No phone number, but an address Duncan knew not far away. He wrote the house number on the palm of his hand. As he walked down first one street, then another, he tried not to be hopeful. <coughs> Excuse me. Who would get rid of a dog if it didn't have a problem? He wished he could put into words what he was looking for, not a size or age or breed, apart from no more Dax sounds like the previous dog, but some kind of emanation. At the sight of the house, he checked his palm, hoping he'd got the number wrong. The front garden was thick with weeds. Moss grew between the bricks around the door. Remembering the drawing, Duncan pushed open the gate. Sorry, he knocked twice. He was bending to move a snail off the path. <coughs> Excuse me, there's something in Massachusetts today. He was bending to move a snail off the path when he heard the latch turn. Two slender feet clad in black socks occupied the threshold. 
Hey, said a voice. A boy a little older than Matthew was regarding Duncan with an open gaze. Hey, Duncan set the snail down among the weeds. I saw your notice in the newsagents about the good dog. Something changed in the boy's expression. Had the dog already gone? I don't mean to be rude, he said, but is this okay with your mum and dad? Not everyone likes dogs. It's definitely okay. Duncan explained about Arthur and the failed visit to the animal rescue. Why don't you want your dog anymore? I'm going to London, the boy said. I can't take care of Lily as well as myself. She needs company, regular walks. Lily, thought Duncan. The boy opened the door wide and led the way down a corridor to the kitchen. A dog, a little bigger than Arthur, was sitting on a tattered red rug, her front paws, not especially large, neatly together. Duncan knelt down a couple of yards away and held out his hand. Her coat was sleek like that of a black Labrador, but her ears were pricked like those of a corgi, only smaller. She studied him for a few seconds. Then she stood up and walked towards him, taking him in with her dark eyes. She was not a puppy, but still young. She sniffed his hand, sat down, and held up her right paw. The invitation was clear. Duncan felt the rough, pad, the rough pads, the prick of nails. Lily emanated. Wonderful, wonderful. And she does, and this book emanates as well. Uh, well, let's see if we can detect any emanations from our group here. Are there any questions for Margot? And while we're waiting for those questions, I'm scanning the screen. Margot, what are you, uh, what are you reading? DJ Ribel raised his hand. Oh, uh, he did. Yes, he, he did. He did indeed. The question I had, because I'm always interested in, in you know, what writers know going into a book. Um, and you mentioned that uh, in addition to, you know, the, uh, there needing to be a, a, a mystery, uh, you, you said that, you know, each of the, 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 the three uh, children, Matthew, Zoe, and Duncan, uh, we're going to have uh, a, a quest, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, did you know they would have each have a quest when you started, uh, and did you know what their quest would be, or were those things that came to you in the writing, or was it different for each character, or, or just exactly how did that kind of shake out? Uh, so nice to see you, CJ. That is a very writerly question. <laughs> Great to see you, too. Um, I did know that Matthew, the oldest, would play the role of a, of, of, of a detective, if you will, trying to, trying to find a solution. And I knew that Duncan, the youngest, would be adopted. Um, but I, I did have to cast around to, for, for what Zoe was going to be looking for and to make it... Um, I didn't want it just to become a kind of girl, girl looks for boy story. I wanted it to have more resonance than that and to have a kind of uh, a, moral, a moral quest, if you will. And I think each of the children in different ways studies with this mysterious idea of truth. And can we tell the truth? What happens if we tell the truth? And if we can't tell the truth, what does that mean? And I was writing this, of course, all this against the background of what's been happening, I regret, in many countries for the last few years. So that idea of, you know, we all have our own perceptions of things, but does that mean we each have our version of the truth and what can we agree on? Felt like a really pressing question. In fact, the kids have a pact that would be welcome, don't they? Doesn't Zoe draw them into a pact not to lie? Zoe tries to get them all to agree not to lie for, I think, a week. And they give up after three days, having each made several enemies by, <laughs> by not being able to lie. It turns out to be a huge handicap. 
the are there other questions that arose yes paula let me see if i can unmute you i want to ask you do you ever write about yourself do you find autobiographical things creeping into your work i would be amazed if you could find any writer who um Truth, answers this question entirely truthfully. But I will say, um, yes, I am writing about myself and I, I give parts of myself, I think, to all my characters. Um, you know, so they each have things in common with me. And one of the things that I was tempted to say when Liam asked about the origins of the novel was that for 40 years, I believed myself to have no living relatives. My mother died when I was very young and my father when I was in my early 20s and they were both only children. And then in my early 60s, um, thanks to Ancestry.com, I discovered that I do have relatives. They just all happen to live in Australia. And this was a huge discovery for me. Um, and so I went to Australia to meet them. And uh, there were many of them, maybe 30 people who were all in some way related to me. I couldn't always keep quite straight. And I kept sort of thinking, am I feeling something special because we're related? Do we have something in common because we're related? Does it make a difference that I share 6% of my DNA with you? And so Duncan, I gave those feelings to, to Duncan as he searches for his birth mother. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Hi, Margo. Hi, Bruce. Um, I was wondering, I think there may be a novel or two of yours that I haven't read, but I've never read one that I didn't like a lot. And I was wondering, just in listening, I haven't read this one yet, but in hearing about it, if there's anything about it that for you harkens back to some of your earlier books, I was thinking of Criminals and Eva Moves the Furniture for some reason, just because of the suspense and the sort of uh, almost spiritual tone or, or a, a certain, uh, you know, attention to, to things that are sort of beyond the natural world, maybe we could say. Yes, I've noticed that about my own work, and I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about it, but I, I have no desire to sort of, um, you know, subject myself to therapy about why I've written <laughs> a number of novels that are fairly more hard-edged, like Criminals and The Missing World, and to some extent Mercury, quite plot-driven novels in which people behave quite badly, and then novels that are gentler, if you will, in tone, like The Flight of Gemma Hardy and Eva Moves the Furniture and now The Boy in the Field. And I can't quite say why my impulses play out in these two ways, but The Boy in the Field, I, I do have a preoccupation with, you know, with missing, abandoned, lost, um, bereft children. And that does play out in my novels in different ways and I think the boy in the field is in some ways in conversation with both Eva Moves the Furniture and the flight of Gemma Hardy, um, these lost children seeking things. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. Thank you. One of the things my editor pressed me about was the fact that my three teenagers don't swear very much and they do the dishes and they're pretty nice to their parents. And <laughs> um, she, she kept saying, shouldn't they be a little, a little more, you know, but part of what I was trying for was a certain sort of, I wanted the book to feel both um, rooted in 1999, but also to have a slightly timeless quality. And also I've been, I have a personal resolution to swear less, until the incumbent of the White House has changed. Well, there's too much swearing already in public life, so I couldn't have my characters swearing. Yeah, that's one. You must have been swearing a lot, Margot. For <laughs> this is a lot to atone for. The um, 
you were going to mention what, what you've been reading. I'm curious to hear what's on your nightstand. Um, my nightstand, as always, is, is tottering. I, I'm just looking to my left to see. Um, I have um, Yi Yan Li's Must I Go, her latest novel, which I'm eagerly looking forward to. Um, I have uh, Britt Bennett's The Vanishing Half. Um, that I, I just finished The New Wilderness by Diane Cook. It's a mm. dystopian novel set in some not very distant future where America is turning into a toxic wasteland. I mean, it's so implausible. I, um, and then I have Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Oh, yeah. Novel about um, Shakespeare's, is it Shakespeare's sister? No, Shakespeare's daughter, I think. Yes, I think, yes, daughter and, and children that I was trying to sort it out. It looks fascinating. Yeah. What about the, you? Uh, well, I have, I've had The Boy in the Field on my book, so that's, it's been hard to read anything else. I've, I, but beyond that, I've been, I also have Britt Bennett's book, which I started, and I think it's gorgeous. Uh, I was, I've been looking into off the current scene or uh, Daniel sent me a book by Maurice Conde, uh, the winner of the alternate Nobel from uh, Guadalupe has a book out, The Tragic and Wonderful, Wondrous Life of Yvonne and Ivana. Um, and I was looking at some of her older books too, like Windward Heights, which is kind of a take on Wuthering Heights, but set on the island of Guadalupe. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And my kids, you know, I, I always like to, when some people ask me what I'm reading, I always like to mention, you know, here's what's coming up, which reminds me, Emily Gray Tedrose, uh, The Talented Miss Farwell is coming out the end of the month. I'm really excited about that. Um, but I, my kids have, or my teenagers uh, told me to read um, The Ninth House by Lee Berdugo, which is not uh, something that shows up in a lot of literary fiction lists, but it's, um, so it's kind of gothic horror, mystery, genre, fantasy, something. And uh, not my taste at all, but I have to say, I, I, I read right through it. So it was really, really fascinating. And um, she, it's a kind of a mythography or mythology of uh, Yale University and all the demons apparently who attend that school. Uh, so I, I read it in one great gulp, but uh, it was interesting. It was, it's also a trilogy and so the book didn't end. So the craft made me was interested in kind of like how a book comes to an end. Um, People are probably wondering how this conversation comes to an end. I think it's, we're not gonna do it just yet because I, there's just, I'm not ready to let go of this book. So I just have a couple more things. And I also wanna, if anyone else has a chance or has an idea for a question, I wanna let you into it. But could you, I just want, as a, a fellow writer, I want to hear you talk about that uh, ficus tree a little bit more. Like your process, do you really kind of assemble it from a collage of different work coming in or do you start from point A to Z and then go back to A again and write through? Like, what, how do you assemble your books? I, I do aspire to begin at the beginning and go forward, but I make many wrong turns. Um, not very far into the book, one does, we learn that the boy in the field, Carol, he's from the Czech Republic, um, works in a, a local hospital and at one point I started to set material there and to experiment with with that as a setting and I wrote quite a lot of pages before I gave up on that. As a ambitious teenager I was a Red Cross cadet and one of my one of the things I had to do was to spend a week working in a local hospital and I was very fascinated by that experience and probably entirely obnoxious to the patients. <laughs> I was constantly saying, what's the matter with you? What does this do to you? you know, I mean, <laughs> so inappropriate. Um, so, but, you know, so I would say I, I wander unsteadily forward, but I did have a beginning and I did have a place I was heading. There's, there's also a wonderful thing, and you alluded to this before because you want to write a short novel that there are these great gaps. This is not a book. So for readers who get impatient with books, they walk them through and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. There's a lot of, um, there's like a headlong rush to this book where we just kind of leap forward in time, certain chunks. And how did, it sounds like such an obvious thing. How did you choose what to put in and what to put out? But each person, as you said, just got one or two indelible images to kind of move the plot along. And I, 
I just found that absolutely fascinating. And I'm just kind of interested curatorially, did you kind of step back and say, well, Zoe's gonna to need to get to Oxford. So I'm just gonna put her in Oxford rather than have her mull about how she gets there. Um, I wanted, uh, that's a wonderful question, but I wanted to ask you, what about in Paris by the book? Did you have a beginning and then move forward to the end or did you negotiate or wander the streets of Montmartre until you found the answer? Yes, that was definitely my plan to wander the streets of Montmartre until I found the answer, but my family wanted me to come back home. So I, did, I didn't get to do that, but that's a, that's a good question. I mean, for me, I've, I've always thought that I have to write to figure out where I'm getting to. And so, and it's only once I finish the book, I realize how it needs to start. So for all the books I've written, um, I've always written the first chapter last, but I always wrote the first chapter first too, because I was, I needed something to launch. Who is it? Is it CJ? Might know, is it, uh, or someone on this call will know, is it William Stafford or is it E.L. Doctorow who says writing is like driving at night. You can always see as far forward as the headlights, but that's enough. I think it's, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, really? Yeah. But I, lo I love that image because, uh, and I particularly liked it for, in this book, I had that experience of with your book when I was listening to it driving up into northern Wisconsin. It literally was because it kept getting darker and darker. But I like that idea. And then once daybreak comes, you can come back and see the route that you've taken and see if this all makes sense. But it's hard to know exactly. I mean, in, with, response, with respect to your question about detail, I had a, a period when I was commuting to teach at Bowdoin College in Maine. and. I listened to a lot of books on tape and I noticed that my driving changed considerably, you know, Pride and Prejudice, I was just a lovely, lovely person. Um, <laughs> or more Leonard, I was sort of a maniac. But, um, but I did listen uh, to a number of Elmore Leonard and, you know, his great statement, I, I, I leave out the things other people put in. And yes. a big part of the process of this novel was writing quite a lot and then taking out as much as I could or distilling what I had to get at the, to get at the essence as, as it were. And I kept returning to the great novels of uh, Penelope Fitzgerald, one of my heroines. Yes. Yeah. Now, and, you know, of course, William Maxwell's So Long, See You Tomorrow, just thinking, these feel like armful novels and yet they're so short, how did they do it? And I think it's, I think a reader wants uh, sometimes, I mean, that, that, that one genre novel that I mentioned reading The Ninth House, it, it moves along, but it's 500 pages. And that, that is a long journey through a book. Not that it's certain books aren't worth it, but I'm always kind of fascinated by, this. a certain pleasure when I kind of pick up a book and say, I'm going to be able to finish this. And, and your book in particular, I moved through it so quickly. Um, and then I went back and read it again to kind of savor it all the more, which is the same thing I would like to do for this evening, which is to ask all the same questions, have all the same, <laughs> tell all the same stories and even go through it deeply and maybe interrogate uh, C.J. Reibel on how he got to the Czech Republic so quickly when I just saw him the other day here in Milwaukee. But he's, his own virtual background almost, almost rivals my visit here to Oxfordshire. Is there anything that we didn't mention, Margot? I mean, I did put on a tie for this whole thing, so I want to make sure that we do everything justice. I think you have done my novel amazing justice um, and set a very, very high bar for anyone who may dare to follow in your footsteps. That about wraps it from the third floor of my house here in Oxfordshire. <laughs> of course. Well, Liam, thank you so, so much. And my gratitude to Daniel for his fantastic hospitality and to all of you who showed up and to CJ for an utterly appropriate backdrop for my novel with my Czech character. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Margo. It's a wonderful book. It's great for clubs. And uh, I really look forward to cheering on its success. We are so grateful for tonight's event. Have a wonderful trip to Chicago tomorrow, Marco. And, um, <laughs> and um, thanks all of you to coming. Thanks, Liam, for a wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you all. We hope to see you at another event. We wouldn't have a virtual without you. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you.